Now, online retail is expected to grow 8 to 12 percent in 2017, according to the National Retail Federation. That's up to three times higher than the growth rate of retail overall. One person that knows a thing or two about this sector is Kirsten Green, who has made her name by investing in a couple of e-commerce unicorns, including Dollar Shave Club and Jet.com, two of the biggest e-commerce exits in the last few years. Green founded the venture capital firm Forerunner Ventures, which also counts Bonobos and Birchbox among its portfolio companies. Joining me now in an exclusive interview, Forerunner Ventures founder and managing director, Kirsten Green. Kirsten, great to have you on the show Thanks, Emily, for the for first time. Me. So you spent years as a retail analyst and decided very early on that e-commerce was where it was going to happen. You were going into malls, you were doing research on foot traffic, and you crystallized this investment thesis. What was that thesis that you started out with? It's that the consumer's path to purchase is really being completely reimagined, And a large part of that is being driven by digital attribution digital technologies that everyone's adopting and I think that's really shaking up shaking up the landscape so you invested in jet which sold to Walmart yep. for three billion dollars bonobos which just also sh sold to Walmart uh, dollar shave which sold to Unilever what did you see in those companies early on I think actually you know most of the things that we're investing in have a, a root business in selling discretionary items and a lot of the path to purchase around discretionary spending has to do with engagement experience um, and bringing something to life that has some element of entertainment or connecting personally to a customer so in each of those instances I think we felt like the founding team had a unique take on the consumer on how things were shifting in the ecosystem on how they could use technology to give a better experience and really a better business model too. I mean, I think the backbone behind a lot of the companies we're investing in are what's the platform that they're building off of? How are they creating a better experience and a better business model leveraging technology? So we've seen spectacular successes in e-commerce, but also spectacular failures. I'm thinking yep. of fab.com. What are we gonna see more of? I mean, e-commerce or commerce speaking is, is a hard category like many areas of business are and I think that you know there are success stories and there are failures and um, I guess if I had to try to understand like some of the core differences between the companies that fall into each of those buckets I would lean on the fact of experience like on how close in touch they are with the consumer how much of the core offering and the core service proposition is really supporting the product that they're eventually selling or the consumer that they're addressing. Amazon is making a big bet on Whole Foods, surprising a yeah. lot of people. They're getting into clothing. How do you know what Amazon is and isn't going to do? Because you don't necessarily want Amazon as your competitor, I right? You have to, I mean, we just operate in a world where Amazon is a formidable competitor. We assume that they're thinking about how to address the consumer very holistically from every angle. Um, and try to understand are there opportunities to play off of that strength that they have. They really are an aggregator, an aggregator of demand. Um, and is there an opportunity for a company to, to use that as much as, you know, it, it, not just be not for it to just be a competitor, but is there a way that they can play in that ecosystem too? Then you have you know some of the biggest online players, including Amazon, moving into brick and mortar. Amazon's opening right. stores, Bonobos has stores, Warby Parker. Why is that? There's been a lot of conversation for a handful of years about omnichannel, the importance of omnichannel. I think we're just starting to see it play out, really. It's not about having a couple of stores and having an online site, but it's really about thinking, again, about that customer's path to purchase, about where are all the ways in which she or he might expect to interact with your brand, your product, your offering. And the, ra the reality is the consumer is everywhere, and the consumer wants what the consumer wants when they want it. And to really build a big business and to meet that demand, you need to think about how you meet the consumer in all those different places and sometimes that means you do transactions online and experience offline and sometimes it's the reverse and everything in between so what's the next big thing for Kirsten Green I mean where are you looking for the next wave we're, we're you know grounded I think in the idea of like who is building a better model for bringing these businesses mm -hmm. to life so much of the consumer ecosystem and how they make decisions have changed that's really impacted the power of a product the power of a brand I think it's gotten a lot more complicated it's no longer we really think about having a great product and having a value proposition as table stakes and really to get the win mm -hmm. is to have that plus a great service and a lot of that has to do with kind of helping them filter through the clutter being 
being convenient, um, being personalized, increasing. And we're, you know, many businesses are on, on stages of meeting those demands, but there's still a lot of opportunity to meet those. Now, we've been covering the story of Justin called back venture capitalist six women have come forward to the information alleging sexual misconduct he has resigned uh, from binary capital uh, a firm that he co-founded lps are now trying to decide what to do his partner Dry jonathan Teo is trying to save the fund what is your reaction to this story you know it's 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 unacceptable behavior and i'd like to think there's no room for that in 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 our sector of business or really any sector of business it's just completely inappropriate to make anybody feel like they're in a in a situation like that lps are deciding what to do what should they do i think a lot of this business has to do with your character your judgment how you're diligencing people how you're building relationships and unfortunately i think that they fell down in, on a lot of those aspects mm -hmm. so I think our investors look to us to have high standards of diligence, high standards of, of, of character, of partnership building, and if we don't, it's hard to be successful in the business. So I think it's a challenge for, for them right now. Reid Hoff Hoffman is asking uh, investors to sign this decency pledge, uh, talking about third-party oversight of the interactions between VCs and entrepreneurs. Is, what, is that enough? You know, whatever it takes to keep moving things forward. Um, you know, people these brave women coming out and bringing the situation to light and starting a dialogue about it and people finding what their own gut reactions are to it and finding ways to express anger, frustration, distrust or not wanting or, or ensuring that they're not behaving that way or their colleagues aren't behaving that way is an important, you know, all, all important steps in the right direction and the decency pledge gives people something to kind of point to or to hold on to and make it a little bit of a movement in that regard and I think, you know, that that's positive. How should other investors and entrepreneurs decide who to do business with and who not to do business with. Again, it's a people-driven business, mm -hmm. and I think you know we make a lot of decisions about what do we think you know fits into our thesis and where do we think the big opportunity is, is and who are we going to be in business with, mm -hmm. and what is the the chemistry and the makeup and the potential for us to be good partners. And we think about that every step of the way when we bring new team members onto the company or when we bring new investors onto the company. It's one of the parts of the business I like the most. It is really a collaborative business. A lot has been made about how hard Silicon Valley can be for women. Yeah. How do we make the valley better for women? We could have more women out there doing business. We could have more people embracing it. Um, I feel like this year the, the media has been good to me in talking about some successes. I think that's important. Hopefully that serves as a role model or inspiration. And just you know, keep working to make that happen.